great to be here tonight in Belmont. The best part about being in, here in Belmont is that I, not only that I like this area very much, I lived in both Lexington and Arlington about a different lifetime ago, but uh, way, way back. But, you know, so many nights I find myself returning from book talks from southern New Hampshire, southern Maine, Rhode Island. This is great. It's going to take me less than an hour to get home. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and while we're on the subject of thank yous, obviously I want to thank the Belmont Public Library, but I particularly want to thank the, both the Historical Society and the Friends of the Belmont, Belmont Public Library for sponsoring this talk jointly tonight. Uh, you know, libraries these days uh, cannot have enough good friends. So uh, Belmont is blessed, clearly, to have some wonderful friends. So thank you. Thank you all for that. Thank you for coming out tonight. How many of you were, this is my second uh, trip to the library here. Uh, how many were at my first talk? Oh, that's good. Not enough, but that's good. Um, I'm going to be talking about my third book, uh, all about an iconic New England institution. You know, everybody at Chronicle knows that there, there are actually two New England iconic institutions that I cannot pass by in all my travels all around New England. One of them is a authentic diner, uh, born in New England, and the other is also born in New England, an authentic New England general store. Now, I started to notice about, mm, I always say just under maybe 20 years ago, more than 10, 15 years ago, I started to notice that the diner seemed to be making something of a comeback. Now, why the diner began to disappear, I know a lot of you folks here have a fondness and a taste for history, so you probably are not hearing anything you don't know, you know? I mean, the diner began to disappear with the advent of the fast food franchises nationwide in the late 50s, mid-50s mid even. Uh, and by the 60s, mid-60s, late-60s, you know, the, di the, the fast food franchises, right? The Golden Arches, coast to coast, getting a hamburger for 20 cents on the highway. This was brand new. This was exciting. This was different. This was cheap, right? And so there's no, there's no mystery about why, din why diners began to take a hit. But there's also no real mystery to me why diners also began to make something of a comeback. Because if you fast forward 20 years from when the fast food franchises first appeared, then you know the newness and the gimmick part of it was wearing off. They began to reappear. They began to come back because not only was the newness gone, but people realized that although you might be spending only 20 cents on a hamburger, you generally weren't running into people you knew when you ran into a faceless franchise on the highway. And yet, even if you paid a little bit more for a hamburger at the local eatery, the local diner, there was an added value to that. Yes, you were supporting a local business, but beyond that, you were being part of your community. You were seeing and interacting with people from your community. That's the nature of what we call third places in American life, right? Places like diners. Places like general stores. Now, in terms of general stores, they began to disappear a mm, little bit after the diner did. Only there, what looked like would be a glide path to obscurity for the general store, looked like greased lightning compared to the disappearances of the diners. Because general stores began to disappear in large, large batches. They also have made a comeback. But the fact that the general store has had a resurgence, has come back, that really perplexed me. That's what's behind my wanting to write the book about it, right? Because when it comes to diners, they're unique. They're unique in all the world. They're unique to America, and they're unique. And if you like a diner, how many of you have a favorite diner? Yeah? If you like a diner, like I do, and you're on the highway, and you are lured by that beacon in the night, right? That neon beacon in the night. It's not like you say to yourself or your partner, you know, well, we could stop here, or we could drive a little bit more, see if maybe we, we, we come across a fancy French restaurant. It's not like that, right? A diner is unique. If you want a diner, there's no substitute for a diner. But guess what? When it comes to a general store, there is nothing, nothing, not a single item on a single shelf in a single general store 
in a single town in New England that sells a single item that you can't buy somewhere else? Nothing. Often cheaper. So why would it be that the general store, after sliding to what looked like certain extinction, should come back? Because it has the same thing to do with diners coming back. Community. That's why they've come back. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. That's why I wanted to write this book. Because first, what this book is not, right? So it's a relatively modestly thin volume, right? It would be thicker if it was a comprehensive listing of all of New England's general stores. It's not. So if that's what you were looking for, I'm not going to be offended if you leave now. Uh, it's not a comprehensive listing. It is a narrative of why general stores have mattered so much to the development of our culture in New England, why they began to be threatened with extinction, and more importantly, why they have come back and why today there are towns all over New England that are lucky enough to have an authentic old New England general store that count them as more valuable than ever before. Why would that be? Well, let's start with a little biology. So, you're wondering why, right, why is there a dodo bird? So, you're looking, you're looking at what was an endangered species right, that became completely extinct. You will not find a dodo bird in the face of Mother Earth today. This is an example of a presently endangered species that is not yet extinct. And so is this. Now, when it comes to the type of predator that hunted the dodo to extinction, here's an artist's rendering of what that might have looked like. Yeah, grizzly stuff. When it comes to the type of predator that has threatened the general store with complete extinction, I'm going to tell you right now, none of our hands are clean. You may have consorted with one of these predators recently. I know I have, just in the past week. Right? Right. But here's the thing. There's a reason why I chose these two very modern iterations of the big box store, right? In fact, when the general store began to look like it might be driven out of existence, Sam Walton was still running things out of a single store in Missouri. So how far back is that? That's more than half a century ago, more than 50 years ago. So I want to call attention to the fact this is not new. The general store being threatened with extinction is not new, is not new. You know, I always like to point to one of my favorite chroniclers of American popular culture who noticed this. He was like the, the canary in the coal mine with a poodle uh, when he noticed this. This is John Steinbeck at his home in Sag Harbor, New York, as he was about to set out in his custom-built GMC pickup truck with the camper in the back, which he nicknamed Rosinante. Anybody know what Rosinante refers to? Yeah, yeah. Who? Who said yes? Don Quixote's Corn. <laughs> well, well. Now I know I am in the company of a very literate audience. You are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. It was Don Quixote's horse. And in 1960, 61, 62, Steinbeck set out in Rosinante with his best friend Charlie, and they circumnavigated America. Look what Steinbeck noticed more than 50 years ago. And he had a perfect vantage point to notice this, right? Because he was traveling as is his want. Though he, you know, he loves these small towns. He wasn't interested in the big cities for the most part. And look what he noticed more than half a century ago that the small towns somehow seemed to be getting smaller, the big cities bigger, and those distinctive stores of all their different varieties, including general stores, seemed to be disappearing more than 50 years ago. Now, when Steinbeck was growing up in Salinas, California, this is 1900, this was a scene that was instantly recognizable to virtually every American. And if you didn't frequent a place like this once or twice a week, maybe once or twice a day, you almost certainly did when you were growing up. And if you didn't when you were growing up, your parents definitely did. And yet, when you go 50 years out from 1900, fewer and fewer people are in a general store at all, never mind once a day. So what happens 50 years after this picture? A completely life-changing event. We don't think of it that way because it didn't happen all at once. It happened very gradually, but it reached a turning point in 1950. In 1950, for the very first time in American history, a majority of Americans owned an automobile. And it changed everything. You know, I always say there are certain phrases like, you know, end of the day and uh, bottom line and, uh, end of, you know, 
and Game Changer, right? So Game Changer is one of those hackneyed cliches that's overused, but this was authentically a game changer. We don't even think today, I think, enough about how much the automobile changed every aspect of American life. We think of it in terms of how it changed the way we move about. It was much more than that. It changed the way Americans had relationships. It changed the way Americans went about their work, where they work, why they work, if they wanted to change jobs in a way they would never have done prior to the automobile because of the mobility that it gave them. It changed the way Americans thought in terms of where they wanted to live, how frequently they might move, and it changed, obviously, the way Americans went about commerce, right? If you go 20 years out from this picture, you have the mushrooming of the interstate highway system by the 1970s, and then if you are in a small town, the kind of small town that Steinbeck was describing, and this is the choice at your little local store that he was describing, and now you can jump in the car that's parked outside your driveway and drive an, in an exit or two on the interstate and have this choice, yeah, it makes it kind of tough if you're dealing with this choice. But a funny thing happened on the way to extinction. And this is kind of the central irony that made me ultimately want to write the book. I was interested in general stores. My wife's, you know, I think there is very little, and it's true, there's very little written about New England's general stores. A couple state by state, but no sort of threading them all together. But I wasn't sold. And, uh, but I was looking at it. I was looking at the, the, some of the history, and I was reading some of the, the, the cultural changes that seemed to impact general stores. And then I realized there was this supreme irony. Because what happens is, the same forces that we're talking about that seem poised to extinguish the general store end up being, like the diner, the same forces that save them in the end. How's that? That's what we're going to talk about. So by the time you get to the late 60s, early 70s, again, solely because of the automobile, you have the rise of suburbia in a way that it never existed before. The suburbs have existed since the mid 1800s, but now because of the car, the suburbs you have in every metropolitan area, this is California, but you know this, is, this happens coast to coast. You have the suburbs are evolving and growing and mushrooming in ways they never existed before. You have these what I call super suburban communities where the boomers are now starting families of their own, living in houses with square footages that their parents could only have dreamed about. And a lot of these wonderful super suburban communities have often great school systems and great athletic programs and all kinds of community amenities and community and recreational programs. And in the morning, you drive your car along X number of different strip malls and have your choice of 27 or 30 different places to get any number of different types of coffee. And life would seem to be a modern day utopia, right? So it turns out, it turns out that within maybe a decade of the rise of these super suburban communities, mid to late 60s, early 70s, there are lots of people living in these super suburban communities that actually begin to miss something. With all these amenities, they actually begin to miss something. Anybody guess what that might be? Who said that? Yes, it was community. It was community. A lot of people were missing a richer sense of community, right? Perhaps that they had grown up with, right? And so it turns out that you can have, you can live 20 feet from your next door neighbor. You can smell what your next door neighbor is cooking for dinner, yeah. right? It doesn't necessarily mean you feel part of a close knit community. So it turns out the community is defined by something else. Something that's not just about how many people live in a given spot. It doesn't seem to be just defined by volume or density. There seems to be another quality that defines community. And a lot of people were missing that. They were missing that. One person in particular was consumed with the idea of community in America. And he's somebody who... <clears throat> I feel deserves more recognition than he has. Most people have no idea who he is. I didn't before I was researching the book. 
but he coined a term called the third place in American life. And he spent a decade researching community, what community means in America. The reason that he was interested in doing that is kind of, I mean, when you think about it now, it's kind of dark because community was changing. Again, right? Because of the way that life was speeding up, people were more mobile. You had many more two-parent families where both parents were working full-time. You had a lot of single-parent families. And, the, and people were more mobile. People were moving around more for, for work and so forth. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know, by the 70s, the notion of community was changing in America. It was fracturing. It was going away in a lot of metropolitan suburban areas. And Ray Oldenburg decided to study community because his thought was that if communities as we've known them become extinct, then he will have a body of research to point to what people once called community in America. And he spent a decade studying community. And in 1989, he published his findings. He published it in a book called The Great Good Place. And in it, he had something that was truly revelatory that he had found. It was this. No matter how free as a bird we think we are as Americans, we move where we want, right? We do what we want. We work where we want, go where we want. We still, he found, spend the vast majority of our lives in one of just three places. That's it. Oh, sure, we may. You may take a cruise. You may go to Europe. You may bum around Europe for three and a half years. But that's negligible in terms of a whole lifespan, which is what he was looking at. And what he found was Americans spend the majority of our lives in one of just three places. That's it. The first place, you can probably guess, home, family, right? Second place, you can probably also guess, work. It's the third place that Ray Oldenburg zeroed in on like no one ever had before. Because it's these third places he found that we need and they were disappearing. A third place is not one particular place. A third place can be many different kinds of places. We're in one right now. A third place can be a house of worship. Third place can be a place where you go to get your hair done, a beauty, sh beauty shop, barber shop. Third place could be a general store. It could be a public library. May the good Lord bless them and keep them. It could be a neighborhood bar where you meet a friend for a drink after work, right? Where they really do know your name, right? Yeah. The thing is about a third place, you may go to a third place to do an assigned task, right? You may go to get a carton of milk. You may go to return a book. You may go to get your hair done. You may go to have a drink with Ed, right? But when you go to these third places, they all have something in common. Even if you're going to do an assigned task, you also have, even if it's an unconscious thought, that you will interact with people you know from your community. And these were disappearing. And what Ray Oldenburg found was, that's not just like an add-on. It's not just like, oh, that'll be nice if I run into, you know. It's not just nice. We need that. We need that. It validates our choice of where we've chosen to live when we meet other people who've made the same choice, who we know and like. We need it. And they were disappearing, which didn't mean we needed it any less. We just didn't have them as much. And Ray Oldenburg put his finger on it. And what was happening in a lot of these com communities was that people were missing this. In these big suburban communities, in all these metropolitan areas, a lot of the boomers, as they were starting families of their own, bringing up their own kids, a lot of people felt like, you know what? I really want to live in a pace, in a town where the pace is a little bit slower, maybe, and where people really know each other and interact with each other. You know, in, I believe it was 1975, it might have been 1973, Life magazine published a nationwide poll that a lot of people found deeply upsetting, disturbing. And it was that a clear majority of Americans, more than 60%, said they had only sporadic or infrequent contact with their next door neighbor, right? That's what a lot of these people were feeling. They were living this close. They were living this close. And they had only infre... How can you have only infrequent contact? How could you not bump into your next door neighbor when you go out to your car in the morning? 
but they weren't interacting in any meaningful way. And a lot of these folks in these suburban communities who were feeling like they wanted to have more of a sense of community for their children as they started their own families, moved. Moved. Now, I'm not saying it was one of history's you know, great mass migrations, mind you, but it was sizable. It was sizable. And they moved to a lot of small towns all around New England in search of these smaller, tight-knit communities with these wonderful, thriving third places where people gathered as neighbors. They moved to South Ackworth, New Hampshire. They moved to Putney, Vermont. They moved to Whitefield, Maine. And they found them. And they found them. And they found them. They found them in Barnard, Vermont, just for example. You know? And what they found, too, was that these third places had never stopped being these wonderful third places, these community gathering places. They'd never stopped. The Barnard General Store was the same genuine community gathering place in 1945 as it was in 1985, as it was in 2005, as it was last fall when I was up there. <laughs> but then you jump forward about 20 years. And a lot of these boomers, by the way, people who moved to these smaller towns all around New England, they walked the walk. They bought a lot of these small general stores. Right? And then you go about 20 more years into the future from there, mid-60s, late 60s, 80s, 70s, 80s, you get to the late 90s. And now, a lot of these people are getting older. They're thinking, maybe I'd like to slow down. Maybe I'd like to interest somebody else in buying the store, take a little time off. Sounds like a good idea. The economy nationally is doing this. People are not buying general stores. Okay. And so a lot of these stores, a wave of them, a wave of them, if you look at the data, it's a wave close. More than half the general stores closed in an eight-year period. And now it really does look like the general store had a little flash of life there. Thank you, boomers. It looked like, right, it might come back. And now it looks like, well, you know, the butter churn isn't coming back either. Had a good run. And I think that if it weren't for one small South Central New Hampshire hill town, more than 50% of the general stores that exist still today in New England would be gone. Would be gone. Because one small town decided that sometimes, to use another hackneyed cliche, but I use it advisedly because just like the game changer with the, car, the automobile in 1950, there's no other way to say that sometimes it took a village to save the general store. And it certainly did in South Ackworth, New Hampshire. I don't know if you're familiar with South Ackworth. It's one of those forgotten little hill towns um, that a lot of people aren't familiar with. I wasn't that familiar with the area until about five or eight years ago. And then it became one of my favorite parts of New Hampshire. Think jumping over the border into southern New Hampshire, go a little bit west, Peterborough. Right? Okay? And now not? Now go a little bit further west, Keene. Now you're on the Vermont border. Now make a triangle from Peterborough and Keene up into the hill country. And you have South Ackworth, you have Marlow, Westmoreland, Alstead, these wonderful little hill towns. And there has been a general store in South Ackworth for almost 150 years. All the general stores in this book have been around for at least a century, and three quarters of them for twice that long, more than 200 years. All of them have always been a general store and never anything else but. They all have occupied that same physical footprint for all of that time, except one, which will be the last store we'll talk about. But most importantly, every store in the book is a genuine community gathering place. There are no places in the book, or would be in the book, that simply call themselves a general store. They are all third places. They are all genuine community gathering places. And this was certainly true in South, Ac in South Ackworth. But you know, the owners of the store there, <clears throat> had owned the store for 37 years, way more than the average. And by the time you get to 2000, they also were ready to slow down. They hoped to find a buyer for the store. Couldn't do it. They tried to sell the store. Couldn't do it. In the wake of 9-11, 2001, as you know, one of the after effects was that <coughs> tourism was off more than 90% in some parts of New England. People just weren't traveling. And for some of these small general stores, that's vital. The tourism traffic is vital for at least two or three seasons a year. And the store closed. 
and the town had to deal with the fact that they had lost their one single genuine community gathering place, their only one, but nobody seemed to be able to come forward to buy the store. And finally, they had a meeting one time, and somebody was, taught, was speculating. They said, you know, what if we could do collectively what we don't seem to be able to do individually? What if we all pooled our money? Look, they'd already pooled their money to put an ad in the New York Times Sunday Magazine for someone interested in owning a general store. That didn't work. They said, what if we put our money together and we bought the general store as a town together? I know. Sounds very socialistic. <laughs> Sometimes that works. Okay? Call me a socialist. Sometimes there's no alternative but to come together, right? We do it to help somebody out in dire straits, right? Well, they came together to help out their store, which was in dire straits and also important to them and also like a member of the family. They came together, they did something that had never been done with any general store in America, and that was to come together and form a co-op and own their own general store. It was just like a food co-op. You put in X amount of money, you get X amount of discount on your groceries if you put in X amount of hours in working in the store. And they did. They formed a co-op, people went to work in the store, they came up with all kinds of other creative ideas, they, they built a pizza oven out back to bring in more money, they started these wonderful quarterly harvest dinners that today bring in visiting chefs from all over New England. The South Ackworth Village store today is thriving like never before, but more importantly, they created a template, they created a model that other general stores all around New England that would find themselves in the same position could look to and say, look what they did in South Ackworth. If it had failed, if there wasn't a model, I believe there'd be 50% fewer general stores in New England today. And I hope the lights don't go out there anytime soon. But in Shrewsbury, Vermont, a very different story about a village coming to the rescue of their village store. Because here it wasn't only a small town going up against the bum economy and a store that had closed. They also had to deal in a major way with Mother Nature. Now, when this picture was taken, Marjorie Pierce on the right there was in her mid-70s. And at that point, her family, the Pierces, had already owned and run Pierce's General Store for over 75 years, right? And it is the heart and soul of Shrewsbury, Vermont. It is the heart and soul of Shrewsbury, Vermont. Phil, can you see, because I realize I've been standing here the whole time. Are you, are you sure? Okay, all right. I'm <laughs> Uh, just tell me to move. Seriously, you can just go like this and I'll, and I'll move anytime there's a problem. But it is the heart and soul of Shrewsbury, Vermont. You are looking at downtown Shrewsbury, Vermont at rush hour. No, I'm assuming because there's two people. But, you know, but if you go out 20 years to the mid-90s, Marjorie Pierce was in her mid-90s. And at this point, she would like nothing so much as a chance to take a little time off. Thank you very much. Okay, can I please get off my damn feet already? Okay, problem is that if Marjorie Pierce is not there to open and run Pierce's till it closes at six o'clock, the store isn't gonna be open. So she wanted somebody to buy the store, just like in South Ackworth, and she could not find someone to buy the store, and the store closed. And just like in South Ackworth, the little town of Shrewsbury, population 842, had to wrestle with the fact they had lost their one community gathering place. Well. Marjorie Pierce felt terrible. It wasn't like she could reopen the store. She still couldn't stand there and feed all day, but she did call up one of her best friends, who happens to be one of my favorite New Englanders, now that the store was closed, Paul Brune. Now, Paul Brune is someone, I bet a lot of you folks who have a fondness for history, as I do, um, would love Paul Brune. Paul Brune is the creator and the executive director of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And what the Preservation Trust does today, all across America, they started doing in Vermont. And what they do is, they help cities and towns all across the country hold on to their history. And they don't do it out of an overdeveloped sense of sentimentality, okay? They do it out of a very developed sense of economics. Because what they have found, it sounds simple, right? It sounds self-evident. <laughs> Try telling that to the number of cities and towns that go tear down historical properties all the time. And they almost always end up ruining what they've done, right? The gospel that Paul Broom preaches is that if you preserve 
a historic property. We could be talking about a historic Main Street, a shopping district. We could be talking about a historic movie theater, a library, a general store. Perfect example is a mill complex, right? A mill complex that is abandoned, shut down. Yes, they, you know, ask Haverhill. Perfect example. It's like my favorite example. You know, like so many mill towns all around New England, didn't matter where, North Adams, Woonsocket, Worcester, Fall River, by the time you get to the 60s, the mills have, 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 have shut down, right? The textile industry, all moved on. And you're sitting on these mill complexes that are falling apart. They're havens for drug use and crime. And these cities wanted nothing so much as to be able to take a huge wrecking ball the size of Chicago and obliterate these things, right? Those buildings were not made to be torn down, <laughs> right? And many of those cities, like Haverhill, found that it was going to actually cost more money to tear them down than it might to develop them. So they sat. They sat. And they sat. Ask the mayor of Haverhill today if he's glad they didn't tear those buildings down. Because today Haverhill is a thriving bedroom community for Boston, of all places, because the commuter rail runs right through there, and at a fraction of the cost of living in Boston, you can live in a condo in what was once a mill complex. That's the gospel Paul Brune preaches. Don't tear it down and leave a vacant lot because developers are not interested for the most part often in trying to imagine what they could put in a vacant lot, just like home buyers would almost always rather be able to imagine what they could do with a property they can see. All right. Well, that's not what Marjorie Pierce wanted to talk to Paul Brune about, but it was in a way. So she called up Paul, she said, Paul, I need to talk to you. So Paul, being the guy he is, he jumped in his beta Prius, and he drove down from Burlington, and he met with Marjorie Pierce. And she said, Paul, I need to reopen the store. And he said, how are you going to do that, Marjorie? She said, I'm not going to do it. You are. He said, I'm sorry? She said, I'm going to give you the store. And I'm going to give you $10,000, which you don't deserve, but... Pretty much all the money I have, and I don't expect to need it too much more. So Paul had to explain to Marjorie that this is not what the Preservation Trust does. They don't own, they're not property owners, right? They help cities and towns invest in their own properties. They help them raise money. They help them find grants. They help them find low, in, low interest loans. They help them get federal funding, state funding, local funding, but they don't own property outright. And Marjorie Pierce listened, and she said, piffle. <laughs> well, to hear Paul Broom tell it, it went like that back and forth about 35 minutes. About 35 minutes later, Paul Broom was back in his beat-up Prius, making his way back up to Burlington. And guess what? The Preservation Trust owned its first piece of property outright. <laughs> to hear Paul tell it, you try saying no to Marjorie Pierce when she's in a fettle, right? <laughs> so he did come back down to Shrewsbury about a week and a half later, and he had told the local historical society, you guys can relate. Like my friend Sally Dinser there in the middle who runs the Historical Society, he had tipped off the Historical Society. He wanted to meet with them at the store. So there they are. They met at the store. And he told them, he said, look, a lot of changes here, I realize. He said, you know, and it's true. He said, I, I hold the deed to Pierce's, but I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be running the store. And they said, well, who's going to run it? And he said, you are. <laughs> and they said, whoa, whoa, they were freaking out. They were like, Paul, Paul, whoa, whoa, whoa. None of us, we're, we're Vermonters. We don't run businesses. We're craftspeople. We're farmers. The guy with the hat makes cheese. <laughs> yeah, I'm, no knock, but he wasn't ready to run a store, right? So he sold it to the store. But they didn't want to run a store. He said, relax. He said, we've done this before. We'll do it again. We're going to take lots of field trips. You're going to have lots of homework. You're going to learn how to inventory a store. You're going to learn how to order product. You're going to learn, you're going to learn how to renovate a 200-year-old general store. And I think they did a pretty fine job. Don't you? Right. Now, I'm not saying it didn't go off without a hitch, okay? Because just before they reopened in 2009, they went back before the town and they asked for another 1500 bucks. Now, this is a community of 842 people that had already raised $68,000. That's a lot of money, right? 
They want a $1,500 more. They said, if we are going to be a genuine community gathering place through thick and thin, through the worst that a Vermont winter can throw at us, we feel we need to have an emergency generator so the lights will always stay on, the community can depend, we can meet here, it can be that kind of gathering place if need be. And you know, there was a lot of grumbling, you know, oh, Marjorie Pierce never needed an emergency generator, but they got it. They got the emergency generator, and in 2009, they reopened, and the beating heart of little Shrewsbury, Vermont, downtown Shrewsbury, Vermont, was beating once again, and all was good for two years. Remember I said Mother Nature weighed in? Right. Well, ironically, ironically, it ended up being the worst that a Vermont summer could throw at them. Not a winter, because in August 2011, Hurricane Irene barreled up the East Coast. It had been downgraded to a tropical storm by the time it reached the Green Mountains, but no matter, right? It doesn't matter if you're packing the 75 mile an hour winds of an official hurricane or the 67 mile an hour winds of tropical storm Irene, you're still gonna blow away 200 year old covered bridges like so much driftwood, and it did. The first day Irene hit Vermont, which is still the, the state's worst natural disaster in its history, power went out virtually all over Vermont, lights went out, all over Vermont, including little Shrewsbury, Vermont, with one exception. Because in Shrewsbury, Vermont, Marjorie Pierce and her crew, talk about the historical society saving the day. They trooped over through the rain and the wind and the howling and the flying debris. They fired up that emergency generator. The lights came on to hear Sally Dines would tell it. She said, you know, I looked out those windows late in the afternoon that Irene hit. She said, it looked like something out of Night of the Living Dead. She said, people were like coming out of the woods, <laughs> seeking out the light. And they got to the store and the lights were on and the coffee was hot and the Wi-Fi was working and people were able to call their relatives and tell them everything is okay. And you may not be surprised to learn Nobody's ever bellyached about that emergency generator ever again. <laughs> so now we've reached, we've, reached, we've reached a pivot point. We've talked about why general stores mattered early on in New England's history, why they were threatened and how they began to disappear, and how they began to be saved, right? But now you reach a point by the mid-2000s where the national economy is doing this now, right? Now it's booming. Now it's doing good. So now all over New England when you have cases where general stores are closing, there are now some individuals who can come forward and can single-handedly save the general store. In a chapter I call Honey, I Bought the Store, I like to kid my friend uh, Larry Beerfield. Oh, yeah. yeah, anybody been to Ferns in Carlisle? Just a little west of here, yeah, yeah. I like to kid Larry that he's the only person in the chapter Honey, I Bought the Store who actually said those words verbatim to his lovely wife Robin. Honey, I bought the store. He came to my first book talk, actually, and he corrected me. He said, Ted, I didn't say, honey, I bought the store. I said, well, I thought you did. What did you say? He said, no. I said, honey, I'd like to buy the store. I said, Larry, that's even worse. <laughs> I said, you're very lucky, Robin, didn't say, honey, I hope you didn't throw out the receipt. Uh, but you know, the great thing about Larry and Robin, um, they sold the store this past year, and they could have sold the store any time over the last 15, 20 years. They really almost needed to have sold the store for a variety of reasons in the last two years, and they still didn't because they were determined to find a buyer who would commit to keeping the store a general store. So they get a huge, huge round of applause from me in my book. But my favorite Honey About the Store involves, I think, it's safe to say the most unlikely general store owner in America. Steve Carell. Steve Carell. So yes, a genuine bona fide Hollywood celebrity. You know, uh, if you watch The Office, probably better known as the world's worst boss. Um, you know, Steve Carell grew up in Acton, Massachusetts, just a little bit west of here, right? And um, when Steve was growing up there, now that I've talked to him on the phone, I call him Steve. Uh, <laughs> when Steve was growing up in Acton, there was a, a, a wonderful general store, unfortunately long gone. But he said it was the first place that he was allowed to go all by himself as a little boy on his bike, probably with his own allowance money jingling around in the saddlebag of his banana seat bike, to buy candy all by himself. How many of you had the same experience? How many of you, for how many of you was it a small local store? 
where you were allowed to go first all by yourself, right? I love asking that because so many people, a majority usually in the room where I give it to, have had that same experience. Same thing for me. Same thing for me. I grew up a little east of here. I grew up on Boston Harbor in uh, Winthrop, or as I like to refer to it, the charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27L. Uh, it was... It was a noisy childhood. Same thing, little local store, allowed to go to first. And it was the same thing for Steve's wife, Nancy. Steve's wife's Nancy, who grew up in um, this way. There she is. She grew up on the South Shore. She grew up in Cohasset. And same thing for her. Uh, she told me on summer nights, her and her big sister, Tish, used to go next door to Marshfield, the Marshfield Hills General Store, where they would buy penny candy or have an ice cream. And about 15 years ago, Nancy's sister, Tish, went out to Hollywood over Christmas time to visit her sister and her famous brother-in-law, and while she was there, she told Nancy that the Marshfield Hills General Store is up for sale. And Nancy said, who do you think is going to buy it? And Tish said, I don't know if anybody's going to buy it. And Nancy said, what are you talking about? And Tish said, she took out a copy of the Globe that she'd been reading on the plane. She said, read that. And it turns out some local developer was proposing turning it into condos. And at that point, Steve Carell, overhearing this, went into the kitchen where they were talking. Long story short again, when Nancy's sister Tish returned out here to Boston that Christmas time, she had with her a blank check to purchase the Marshfield Hills General Store. And it is an authentic New England General Store in ways that some general stores that still exist elsewhere in New England don't even have anymore. Um, it still has, on the far right there, it still has a working post office attached to it. Time was that the post office was an integral part of every single general store, but the USPS is not real fond of that arrangement anymore. You don't see it much anymore. It's still the case in Marshfield Hills. On the third floor, that, that little attic cupola room, during the Civil War, they stitched Union Army uniforms up there. And I think the Corrals did a great job of maintaining the historical integrity of the store. Don't you? Yeah? Look at those lines. Very, very similar. They kept the historical integrity. And uh, Steve did make his sister-in-law Tish, the general manager of the store. She runs it today. Today, the Corrals own a house in Cohasset. They're out here every summer. And no summer, no summer today in Marshfield Hills is complete without a confirmed Corral sighting at his store, as you can see. So, so far, we've talked really about saving the general store, saving it. But you know, as I put this talk together, I also felt like it was important to pay some homage, if you will permit me to use a fancy French word, to some stores that have never needed saving, right? They deserve a little bit of credit and attention too. These are stores that are so ingrained, so interwoven into the fabric of their community that in these towns, it's impossible to imagine this store being up for sale. Why would it be up for sale? We live there. Everybody does. Right? These are stores I call tried and true. They're all remarkable. I'll just give you one for an example. One of my favorites is up in Warren, Vermont. So kind of up there in the Green Mountains, kind of uh, equidistant between Waitsfield, Warren, you know, ski country up there. Uh, and it is the heart and soul of Warren, Vermont. It, like all these stores, has been there. In Warren's case, here is the early 1940s, but it's been there for over 200 years. And uh, it is, it's really in many ways sort of like a... This way, thank you, okay. I, that, and, and it's perfectly okay, yep, just do that, do that. That's what my kids do when they're watching TV. Actually, they say stuff too, so don't say what they say. But, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get a lot of the, you know, Dad, you make a better door than a window. Um, it is really one of those general stores that when you go in, anybody ever been there? Yeah? Have you ever had a sandwich from there? <laughs> I measure the Warren store sandwiches in miles, right? So it's like some, some sandwiches are fine. Now I'll, I'll look and it's been like 55 miles, right? And I'm still eating the sandwich. <laughs> but it's one of those places that just draws you in. When you're in there, you don't want to leave. I was last in there. So this is funny. Actually, I was last in there three weeks ago when I was shooting a Main Street story for Chronicle that will air just before Thanksgiving. But before that, it was very easy for me to recall exactly when I'd been in there because of what was happening nationally. Before, three weeks ago, I had last been in there in the spring of 2016, March 2016. Uh, so it was, whether you care to recall or not, it was a presidential election year. It was uh, presidential primary season. 
And I dropped in to say hi to my friend Jack Garvin, who owns the store. I said, Jack, what's new? And he said, what's new? What's new? Oh, he said, this is new. He said, uh, we're having a, a contest right now, kind of a little fun contest, to, um, to name the wood stove. <laughs> you know, it does get awfully, Cold. awfully slow by the time you get to March in Vermont. It's... <laughs> Uh, so I said, really? Really? I said, well, have you had any candidates for a new name? And he said, funny you should use that word. So it turns out that literally just about a week before I'd been up to the store, another longtime friend of the store and a rather famous Vermonter in his own right had also dropped in. Jack told him about the stove naming contest. And obviously, I was actually surprised he was around because he was pretty busy at that time in his life. I don't know, I thought maybe he was home doing laundry in Burlington, but he dropped into the store and obviously quicker on his feet than I am, he said he had an idea. He said, I have a suggestion. And they liked it, and he won. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie Sanders won the stove naming contest at the Warren store. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always wonder, just about three months later, Bernie Sanders lost, not won, his bid to get the Democratic presidential nomination. And I always wondered if he took even some small measure of consolation that, unlike Hillary, he won the stove naming contest at the Warren store. I don't know, right? It could be. It could be. We find consolation in many different ways, small and big, small and big. But you know, there are also some general stores that I love to point out that are all of the above. These are like the combo platter of general stores. The one, they're one of a kind because they are everything. They, they have never been up for sale. I don't think they ever will be up for sale. They are tried and true, and they are also each in their own way have something about them that is so unique that they needed their own chapter. Now, one of my favorites is, as it happens, also in Vermont, and uh, it is in Norwich, Vermont, which is kind of the Upper Valley area, right? So imagine like Hanover, New Hampshire, and then go west a little bit, just jump across the Connecticut River, and you're in Vermont, you're in Norwich, Vermont, okay? Dan and Witt were not the original owners. Dan and Witt were actual, actually high school buddies who worked at the store in the 1930s. By the 1950s, they owned the store. They did very well. Business was great. Business was great, they were very confident. They put this sign in the window. You've probably seen variations on that sign before, right? But I always joke at Dan and Witt's, it might actually be true, okay? So they did really well, they wanted to expand, okay? They wanted to expand. Problem was, they were very limited in terms of their expansion options, right? They couldn't expand on this side because of the Norwich Inn. They couldn't expand on that side because of the street. So their only option was to expand directly behind the building in exactly the same physical rectangular footprint of the original building in almost three quarters of an acre that was back there. So that's a lot of land for a small store to occupy, but occupy it, they did. So what makes Dan and Witt so unique is that when you walk in, you know, it doesn't look any different than what you would expect to find in a small New England general store. It's kind of cluttered, kind of claustrophobic, and in fact, the distance from the front door to that back wall where that guy and his son are standing is not any further than where I'm standing right now, certainly not any further from this door to that door, right? But if you go just to the left, there is another doorway. It's just that there's no door, there's no sign. But if you go through that door, you're in a very different place. You're in the back. You're in the back, where it just seems to go on and on as well it should if you were walking down an aisle that's three quarters of an acre, right? And so what you have that makes Dan and Witt so unique, you have in the front, you have a, a, a cluttered little New England general store, and in the back, you have, well, kind of like a general store version of a big box store, right? So you can imagine that you might get lost back there. It's very maze-like. It jumps down a level. It comes back up. You don't know where the hell you are. There's no signs, nothing points you to what you're looking for, and you could get lost back there, and I'm a big enough man to admit, I did. <laughs> I did. Uh, it was a late winter afternoon. 
Uh, Dan Frazier, the original Dan's grandson, was showing me around. He said, listen, we're short-handed. I got to jump back out front. You're welcome to walk around. I did. Five, ten minutes, you know? And then I was ready to, to leave and go back out front. And every single direction I moved did not get me back out. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, it's not alarming as much as it is really embarrassing, right? Because you know where you are. What are you going to do, start yelling? <laughs> right? Right? It's like being lost in a corn maze. You know what I mean? You know where you are. You're in a corn maze in Sterling, Massachusetts. If I could jump on an extension ladder, I'd probably see my car, you know, 30 feet away. But you're still not getting out any quicker. Finally, I, I, I did get back out. I went to the front there, and I found Dan, and I said, Dan, I just got lost in the back. Thank you. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. It happens all the time. I said, really? Oh, yeah. He said, it happens all the time. So it turns out they allow for this, Dan and Wits. And at Dan and Wits, they have the commercial equivalent of the ski patrol. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you ski, but you know, at a ski area, at a ski area, when the lifts close to the public, right, usually 4, 4.30, depending on the time of year, when the lifts close to the public, then the ski patrol goes up, right? And a ski patrolman or woman goes down every single trail and slope to flush it out, right, and make sure, God forbid, nobody's hurt and left behind after dark. At 9 o'clock every night at 367 Main Street in Norwich, Vermont, at Dan and Witt's, they send somebody out to flush out the back. So I said to Dan, I said, that is crazy. I said, I mean, it's not like you find people back there, right, at 9 o'clock. He said, oh, yeah. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I would say... Once or twice a week on average, we'll find like some 12-year-old kid wandering around. I said, that's not good. He said, you know what's really odd, though? This is off the record. He said, uh, what's really odd is that half the time we know for a fact that their parents left like an hour ago. <laughs> now, my other favorite one of a kind is even more unique. It's in Windsor, Maine. And it's interesting, there's some parallels with Dan and Witz for Harlan Hussey. Uh, looks like Hussey, who's a German immigrant, pronounced it Hussey. And just like Dan Witt, he did very well. Had a little one-story garage like General Store through the 20s, 30s, 40s. Did very well. Wanted to expand by the 1950s. Who could blame him? Just like Dan Witt, very limited in terms of how we could expand. He couldn't even expand in back. There's a little brook back there. So he expanded vertically, okay? So he created the now three-story commercial colossus that is Hussey's in Windsor, Maine. And he created a gigantic basement level and an equally gigantic ground floor level and an equally gigantic second floor level. And what makes Huzzies unique, literally in all the world, is a certain combination of things that they sell. Now, so you can imagine if you were going to run in there and you were getting something like, I don't know, a lamp wick, you know, or a pair of boot laces. You might think, well, geez, I'm going to need some guidance since there's a lot of ground to cover here, and it's this stuff everywhere. And so you figure you might need some sort of, you know, sign. Uh, and, and, they, and they have one. And they have one. So if you start reading the sign from the bottom up, you'll mine it for maximum humor value. Okay. So, oh my God. so far, nothing crazy, right? Wood stoves, home and garden, plumbing, electrical paint, hardware, camping gear, fishing, hunting supplies, guns. Bridal gowns, clothes, whoa, what? <laughs> Come again? Right, right. So Huzzies in Windsor, Maine is, as far as our research shows, the only general store in the world where you can buy the combination of guns, gowns, and beer. <laughs> or basically your one-stop shopping for a shotgun wedding. Uh, which, all kidding aside, is what Harlan Huzzy's granddaughter, Kristen Ballantyne, had some fun with on her wedding day. Here's the lovely bride uh -huh. in her wedding picture, and she's holding her wedding bouquet, a six-pack of Narragansett, and the groom is holding a brand new 12-gauge. Okay. <laughs> so, as we finish, as we finish, um, so this is interesting, because this element that I want to share with you to finish with uh, was not part of my book talk. Never mind a year ago. It wasn't part of my book talk even six months ago. But it is now. And this is the third book talk I've put together. And what I have found invariably, and it was true this time too, which is why I'm sharing with this with you now, is that, you know, 
you put a book talk together, at least I don't know how other people do it, but in my case, you know, you, you think about what would be really interesting to people from the book, and uh, you think of a narrative, that a good way to tell it, you know, and uh, you put it together, and then invariably, you go out and you share it, and you find out how stupid you are. <laughs> because half the things you think are fascinating seem to make people's eyes gloss over. And half the things they seem to want to hear about, you have not put in the book talk. So, I have learned to be a little bit flexible and to know that when I ask for questions, as I will tonight, that part of what that does, especially early on with a book, is it gives you some clue as to what people find interesting about this topic, right? And so when I started giving this talk a year ago, every single night somebody would ask me, and I never thought about this question first, uh, if I have a favorite general store. Somebody would say, what's your favorite general store? Do you have a favorite general store? Reasonable question. I wasn't surprised at all by the question. What surprised me after two or three months of getting this question every night was my answer because it never varied. It never varied. And after a couple of months of that, I, I just, I almost drove off the road one night and I, I was driving back from Lunenburg, Massachusetts in a book town. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Why is that my favorite general store? And when I thought about it, I was like, why have I not shared this? Because, and it's perfect at the end, because this general store is the quintessence of my favorite stories that I've done for Chronicle. Which is to say that I've done many stories and they are not all this topic. But probably my favorite, most memorable stories, the ones that I'm really drawn to, are stories about underdogs. Underdogs. They could be underdogs in terms of people who have overcome sometimes horrible, crippling setbacks, obstacles, and yet found a way to continue their life with dignity and respect and success. And they can be an underdog, a city or town, you know, a waterfront like New Bedford or Gloucester that has had to reinvent itself, a mill town like Fall River or North Adams, towns where their prosperity has long since moved on and they have had to deal with the scourge of crime and unemployment and drugs and they find a way to continue. What are you going to do? That's your town. That's your town, right? And you want it to continue. And these are the underdogs that I've been drawn to and then I realized this general store is the ultimate underdog as a general store. It has been beaten down more times than Rocky and it's found a way to get back up. It has found a way to save its general store even when its general store was dead and gone. And I mean gone. So there has been a general store in Putney, Vermont for over 200 years, 1796. Incredibly, A.M. Corser, one of only 13 general store owners in over 200 years. And it has always been a general store. It has often looked just like it looked all through its history, and it has always occupied the same little spot just above Little Sackett's Brook in the middle of Putney, Vermont, except when it didn't. Remember I said there was one store that didn't occupy it, that same spot, that same physical footprint for all of that time? Well, this is the store. The first time it almost wasn't there was on a terrible night in early May 2008 when faulty wiring in the attic caught a, caused a fire to break out about one o'clock in the morning. And thank goodness for volunteer fire departments because they were able to muster very quickly. And although it looks terrible, they were able to save almost two thirds of the building. And it fell to, again, the local historical society, jumping into the rescue, it fell to my friend Lisa Papazian of the Putney Historical Society. Somebody know Lisa? No, it's just my last name. Oh, is it really? <laughs> Maybe you're related. Maybe you're related. You might, all these years, you might have been getting 10% off at the Putney store. You'd have a free t-shirt by now. <laughs> well, Lisa Papazian, Lisa Papazian called up for guidance. Remember our friend Paul Brune? She called up Paul Brune, who jumped in his beat-up Prius and drove this time down to Putney. And he surveyed the situation. He said, well, Lisa, 
First thing we need to do is make the town owners of the store in terms of the historical society uh, because the owners of the store had had no insurance. And they decided to take it as a complete loss, write it off, and they left town. So Paul Brune made the point, persuasive, that, you know, in his experience, he said, I have found that even when disaster strikes, a town cannot leave town. So, right, think about that. So he helped them. And working with Bernie Sanders and Pat Leahy, they found federal funding, they found state funding, they found low interest loans, they helped them write grants, they helped them raise money. A town of just under 1,000 people raised almost $100,000 and they were able to rebuild the store. They were able to rebuild the store. And you know, when the roof went on, when the roof went on, traffic ground to a hot halt in Putney. Everybody got out of their cars. Some cases the cars were still running and everybody got out of the cars and started clapping because the beating heart of little Putney, Vermont was beating once again and all was good in Putney and people breathed a big sigh of relief that their store was open once again. But almost before they had a chance to exhale, it was gone. And as bad as this looks, it's worse. How could it be worse? Well, this was an 18 alarm fire. It wouldn't have mattered if it was 118 alarms because nothing would have put this fire out. It burned down to its foundation stones in less than 45 minutes. But that will happen when you have a fire helped along by massive accelerant, arson. So now the little town of Putney, Vermont, population 967 people, had to deal with a double gut punch. Not only had they just lost the heart and soul of their little town, for the second time in less than two years. But the person who did this horrible thing might be our neighbor. Who knows? That's the terror of arson. So the store was gone. It fell to people in Putney like there had been a death in the family. I can't tell you how many people expressed it in just those terms to me, like a death in the family. They'd say, you know, you find yourself driving home by, by the time the, the sun went down early in mid early November and you know you'd be driving home and you'd turn that corner there by Sackett's Brook and it was dark and for a moment you'd forget and you'd think that you know maybe I'll run in get a cup of coffee see if Steve's there see if Sylvia's there behind the counter and instead you turn the corner and there was just blackness and it, they said it was crushing and Lisa Papazian called up our friend Paul Brun again, and this time Paul, he jumped in his Prius, he came down again, he drove through the night, he got there at six in the morning, they met at the little stone church across the street from where the store had stood. He was very, he had sobering news for them. He said, I've already been on the phone with Bernie and Pat Leahy, and he said, I have to tell you uh, that the uh, federal funding is in the pipeline, but it's dependent on collateral, which is the store, the collateral's gone, the funding, funds are frozen. So there was a lot of frustration, there was a lot of tears, there was a lot of anguish after about half an hour, you know, it's a small, tightly knit town, word got out that they were meeting at the church about the store. And within an hour, there were over 100 people, they had to move the meeting out into the cold open air. And after an hour or so, an older gentleman whose family goes back five generations in Putney stood up on that little low, little low stone wall that meets the street right there by the corner, and he said, uh, he said, I just have one thing to say to you. He said, I don't care about the rest of you, but I'm going to tell you, I will be goddamned if an arsonist will define my town. And he sat down, and Paul Brune kind of let his words kind of hang in the cold air, and he stood up, and he said, well, if I understand my friend correctly here, I think we need to rebuild. And they did. And the one single silver lining of this awful tragedy is that it was such a tragedy that it made front page news all over the world. The picture of the Putney fire was featured on front page newspapers literally around the world, from Paris to Rome to Jerusalem. It led some evening broadcasts of American news shows and money poured into Putney. They had more money than they knew what to do with more money than they needed to rebuild the store. They formed an endowment. They were able to rebuild the store. They were e able to rebuild the store bigger. They were able to rebuild the store safer and more secure. Now, they still needed somebody to run the store. The town owned it, needed someone to run it, 
They lucked out. They found a wonderful person who just seemed like he was made to be there at this moment to run the store because he was, he had been an immigrant. He was a pharmacist. And he said that, you know, when my family moved here and we barely spoke English and we didn't know a soul, we'd go to the store and everybody accepted us like family. And I want to give something back. And they said, well, what do you have in mind? He said, well, if I can run my pharmacy out of even a little corner on the second floor that you don't use, I won't take a dime from the store. And they said, that sounds like a good idea. So he did. He opened his pharmacy on the second floor, and all was good again and whole again in Putney, Vermont, until New Year's Day 2017. No, no. I told you this was an underdog story, right? <laughs> Rocky doesn't bounce up and, and knock out Apollo Creed. It looks like he's never going to be able to win the fight, right? Because on New Year's Day 2017, this lovely gentleman died. And neither of his adult children who moved elsewhere had any business, any idea that they wanted to come back to Putney and run the store. And the store closed again. But this time, Paul Brune got the jump on Putney. He called up Lisa Papazian and he said, you have got to reopen the store. She said, we don't have enough people. He said, Lisa, the longer you stay closed, the longer you will remain closed. Take my word for it. How many people you got in the historical society now? She said, just about 41. He said, good. Everybody put in an hour a week, open the store. And they did. The store opened last May. It is running again now. It is running smoothly again now. It is truly about perseverance, as Paul Broom puts it in Putney. And as I finish up, I do want to inject, I do want to inject a sobering note of reality here. You know, we've talked tonight about saving the general store, but I don't like to do this talk and, and leave people with a, with a false sense of optimism because general stores still close all the time in New England to the tune of about 25 every year close down in New England. And they will continue. They will continue to do that. Probably the most significant loss, if you like history, was six years ago in uh, Little Compton, the little village of Adamsville, Rhode Island, where Gray's closed. When Gray's closed in 2012, it was at that time the longest continuously operating general store in American history, 224 years, or just about 20 years less than the country had been in business. So that's a hell of a run. And perhaps even more poignant, this is a page from my book. When the book went to the publisher last fall, the Monterey General Store, or Monterey in the Berkshires, was alive and well. And today, it's gone. So these will still close. More will still close. And I think that the one thing that now is saving a lot of general stores is a new breed of general store owners, right? General stores need someone to own them. They are not museums. I know we love them, some of them for their, some of their historic and nostalgic value. They are not museums. A museum is a museum. They are a business. And they need someone who can run it successfully as a business and preserve this wonderful history. And there is a new breed of general store owners that are doing this. And what makes them particularly fascinating to me is their relative youth. Not everyone, but many of them are young, millennial young, like 30, give or take, younger, bit older. And it surprises me, no knock on millennials, mind you, but it surprises me because I just had a, 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 a sense that people of that age may not have the same feeling for a brick and mortar pillar of a community that perhaps their parents or their grandparents do, but many of them do. And thank God, I like to call my poster children of the new breed of general store owners in Whitefield, Maine, Ben and Taryn Marcus, the perfect, perfect picture of the new breed of general store owners. And what's so perfect about them, they never wanted to own a general store, <laughs> ever. You're looking at farmers. They met at agriculture school in Washington State. They moved back to Whitefield when they graduated because Ben's family was from there. They thought maybe they'd be able to afford a few acres of land to farm. They looked and looked, couldn't afford it. Finally, a guy in town came up to him one day and said, listen, I know you guys are looking for some land to farm. He said, I'm going to make you a crazy offer. He said, I will give you, give you five acres of prime farmland. They said, what's the catch? He said, ah, the catch. <laughs> he said, the catch is... There's a long-closed general store on that property. 
He said, I always thought maybe I would reopen it, but I don't think that's going to happen. But he said, if you will reopen the store and keep it open for two years, the land is yours. And they still deliberated. That's how much they did not want to run a general store. So they, find, they decided they'd hedge their bets, right? They decided they'll only buy stuff for the store that they like, especially food. See? They thought, we'll only buy food for the store that we like to eat. No, because their thinking was, when this whole crazy thing goes south, as surely it will, we can personally liquidate the inventory. <laughs> right? They figured, we won't have to go food shopping for two years. But that didn't happen. It didn't happen. I mean, the land produced all right. Don't get me wrong. Incredible organic produce. Carrots the, the length of your forearm. And people were suddenly lining up at 6 in the morning on Friday mornings to buy their produce. And then at a certain point, six months in, Ben and Taryn looked at each other. They said, wouldn't it be great if instead of one of us driving hundreds of miles every week to hit every farmer's market in southern New England, which is what you have to do now, wouldn't it be great if we could find somebody to open up like a little cafe in the store to use our produce? And they did. They found a great person to open up a little cafe in the store. And now people were lining up not just to buy their produce, but for breakfast and for lunch, and then, and then they decided they would add all kinds of new services and things that had never been seen in a general store. And this is where the new breed of general store owners actually have something in common with public libraries today. Because you know, the good public libraries today know something, they know something that a lot of people don't think about all the time. And that is a little inconvenient truth, that public libraries today, and by the way, I'm a passionate lover of public libraries. But public libraries today know it is not just about books anymore. It can't be just about books anymore, right? You have many different ways to get a book. You do not have to schlep to the public library to get a book. Download it. Go on Amazon, right? Right. It's better if you don't. However, the good public libraries, the creative ones, the ones that have gotten this trend, have added all kinds of things now that libraries never did before. All kinds of added value, all kinds of services, programs like this one, right? The new breed of general store owners get that too. Guess what? Nobody has come in to buy a general, a, 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 any general store in New England in 25 years or more to buy an anvil or a sledgehammer. Most general stores don't have any hardware anymore. Because you can go to Lowe's, you can go to Home Depot to buy a sledgehammer, if you need a sledgehammer. You know what you can't get at Home Depot? You can't get a wine. <laughs> I see where your priorities are. <laughs> you can't get 20 minutes tearing over a cup of coffee with your friend in town, okay? And that's what they've realized. So they, have, they are now offering things that were never done in a general store. Open mic night. They've had wine tastings. They have yoga classes. They have daycare. They have now the first small lending library within 45 miles. And because of what they've done, now the general store is thriving. Now it is again popular with young families and young and old, and it gives hope. And what gives more hope about the future for general stores than the reopening of Hope General in 2016, that because of this new breed of general store owners, I now have guarded optimism about the future of New England's general stores, and that is New England's general stores. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.